we have um, Paul Rhodes, who is joining us from Greg's. Paul is the head of sustainability um, for Greg's, managing the ongoing development of the Greg's Pledge, their sustainability strategy. Um, he's got a, a really interesting background in regulatory law, external affairs management, um, and this is really an area of expertise for Paul. So, um, and Greg's are a national treasure, and certainly a northeast treasure, even more so. So, can we all welcome Greg's um, Paul, Paul from Greg's to the stage? Thank you. <laughs> I feel a bit of a fraud. Um, normally, when I've been in the industry that I'm in, um, normally when I come to talk at net zero events or decarbonisation or sustainability, I feel like I'm the cleverest person inside. I feel like the cleverest person in the room. It's the total opposite this time. So, um, what I'm going to try and do is I've got about I've got around about 20 minutes. I'm going to give you a bit of a canter through where Greg's are. This is a bit. This is this is your warm up event for the afternoon. Clever stuff comes next. I'm going to talk about what we do from a Greg's point of view, so I'll give you a bit of Greg's history. Um, I'll talk about our sustainability strategy and where it came from and some of the challenges that we have, and then I'll go into a little bit around, uh, around our decarbonis decarbonisation challenge. Because um, I can talk for England, all I would say is, if that, if, instead of waiting for the end for q and I'm quite happy to take any questions as they come up through the, through the session, so please just put your hand up, and one of the guys with the roving mics will come round and uh, you can ask us anything you want from the recipe for our sausage roll. <laughs> so, uh, as Joe says, I'm Paul Owen Rhodes. I'm Head of Sustainability and Regulatory Law, so that's Safety, Health and Environmental Compliance at Greg's. I've been at Greg's 20 years, so I've watched the business probably, you know, uh, more than double in size in that, in that time. Um, that's the only nice photo I could find. So, Greg's has got the nation covered, as we say. We're a FTSE 250 organisation. Um, we've got an integrated supply chain, so that means we're self-sufficient. So we have around about 2,400 shops across the UK. Um, we are UK only at the moment, but we've got very clear international ambitions. Um, we also run our own manufacturing and distribution sites as well. So we've got, I think, 11 manufacturing sites and seven distribution sites. Um, so we run our own fleet. Um, so being self-sufficient. Um, we have just over 30,000 people work for us. Um, we're northeast based, so we started off in Gosforth, which is what six, six, eight miles away from here. Our head office remains in the northeast, and it's been a clear view from our last three chief execs that will stay here, no matter how much the city wants to wants us to move to London. Um, last year, we turned over just over 1.5 billion um, and a profit of just over 400, and, sorry, 148 million. Um, we are the number one. This is it's my favorite, one of my favorite facts at the minute. We are the number one for breakfast in the UK. How good's that? Um, damn you, McDonald's for lunch. But so, Greg's are a really purpose-led organisation. I'm really proud of how we operate as a bit as a business. I mean, I think the title of the, this uh, this talk was about sustainability and, and uh, being in our DNA, and I want to show you how that works for us. So, we are a purpose-led organisation. So, our purpose is very clear. Um, to make great tasting, freshly prepared food, make it accessible to everyone. We've got a clear vision about being the customer's favourite for food on the go. Um, there's a good link into, when I, when I talk about customers here, and I'll mention customers again later on, sustainability forms part of that. So the customer, the, the, the modern day, the, the customer of 2023 doesn't just want a great product at a great price, great quality. He wants to be buying it from a great brand as well. So that's a really important part, for, uh, part of our, our sustainability journey. So, Greg's, as I say, we're from the northeast. Uh, we've been around since around about the 1930s. So, John Greg set us up originally, delivering yeast, eastern eggs on the back of a, on the uh, on the back of his bike. Um, Ian Greg, who took over from John when John passed away in the 1960s, Ian was a um, Ian was a law graduate who took over the business to him and his mum when his dad passed away, uh, and grew us in. The, he took us from two shops in in Gosforth through floating on the on the stock market in, in 1984. Um, Ian's a, Ian's a bit of an inspiration to me. So Ian was an environmentalist back in the 1960s before it was trendy to be an environmentalist. And he was very much around social, uh, about social justice uh, and, and trying to level the playing field no matter what part of society you were from. So when John started the business in, in 1939, he provided free pie and pea suppers for, for all the residents of Gateshead. That was the first part of our sustainability or responsible business journey. 
Um, between John and Ian, they've set some values in the organisation. So we have a set of values that we, we, we try to live and breathe as a, as a, as a Greg's colleague. Um, I'm not going to sit here and say we get it right all the time, but they are something that we strive to deliver. They're not just eight words that you'll see written, on, uh, written at reception when you walk through. They are how we try and operate, and you'll see that in any dealings that you have with Greg's people. So Rasheen Curry is our current CEO. So um, Rasheen, Rasheen's been in the business for about 11 years. Um, so she was our ex, uh, she was our HR director, she was then our retailer at director, and then she's been our, our, our chief exec since uh, February 2022. Uh, and Rasheen, I think, embodies, embodies one, the, the values of, of Greg's, um, but she's also, she's also one of my biggest advocates when it comes to sustainability and uh, being a responsible business. So Rasheen's statement that she talks about is, at Greg's, we believe it is our duty as a modern business to stand for more than profits. Our Greg's pledge is a way of doing more to help people, to protect the planet, and to work with partners to, to, to change the world for the better. And again, that's something that we try, and, we try and go back to. Whenever we're having discussions around what our future business plan and strategy looks like, we try to go back to that, right, and how do we do this in the right way? I've got a, I've got a short film. It's probably about two minutes long. That just gives you a bit, takes you through a bit of a journey about where we've been and where we're going. Or I did have a short film. It was really short, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure why that's not working. That's fine. Don't worry. I'll just, yeah. Whose lines is it anyway? I'll take this on. It's fine. So we've always been, I'll, I'll flick back to that one. So we've always been a responsible business. So we've had, uh, we've had a sustainability kit committee in the business since around about 2010. We've got the Greg's Foundation that supports a lot of the work that we do from a social point of view and in communities. Um, We've set targets, we've set public targets, they've been in our annual report since 2010, um, and we've always done it really, really well. But we found, we, we found that, uh, although we were doing things quite humbly, uh, and because we were doing it for the right reason, we found that in sort of between 2015 and 20, 2018, 2019, um, quite a lot of our competitors and quite a lot of our peers in the industry were doing things and showcasing things, and they were looked, they were being highlighted as being real leaders and the chief exec would come back to me, Roger Whiteside at the time would come back and say, Paul, why aren't we doing this? Yeah, we do that and we've always done it or it's never been important to us, whatever the reason was. So he challenged me, he challenged me after it. We had a, we had a meeting, we had an innovation uh, session in the, in, the, in the office with a load of suppliers and a load of our procurement commercial team. Uh, Roger's role at the end was to have five and we had the guy who set plan A for Marks and Spencers in the room. Um, Roger's role in that was to spend five minutes at the end saying, thank you very much, thanks to the speakers, right, everyone, safe journey home. He talked for about 40 minutes. Uh, and then he come and called me and our corporate affairs director, who I report into, and he says, right, I want us to do something different. He says, I want us to change how we operate as an organisation, and I want you guys to go away and decide what that looks like. So he saw this. He saw that, you know, in between 2018, 2019, 2020, we saw the, the, this, this development of sust sustainability or responsible business being, it, being moving to the forefront of every brand's, uh, every brand's communication plan. Um, we sat and reflected on that, and then we looked at what, was, what would the world be like, what, what's changed. So we saw we have this moral obligation, going right back to our purpose and our, our vision and the values of Ian and, and John uh, in Greg's. We saw that moral obligation. But we saw this, this sort of rise of the conscious capitalist, uh, sorry, the conscious capitalism uh, movement. So this is people who, you know, who are making money but making money in the right way. Uh, and then we saw this impact of what will that look like from a consumer point of view as well. So consumers, they buy, they don't buy from the, there's a, there's a big difference between how, where we operate and where you guys. There's some real similarities behind the scenes. Um, but the consumer, the guy on the street, quite often wants to go, he wants to get a good feeling for the product that he's buying from you. And Greg's are a frontline organisation, so when he comes to us, he wants to get his sausage roll. It's the best in the world, I've got to, I've got to be honest. Um, he wants to get his sausage roll, but he wants to know it's good quality. He wants to know the, 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 the ingredients are great, but he wants to know it's from a great brand as well. We were seeing different pressures from a variety of stakeholders to reduce our environmental impact, because again, we weren't talking about it enough, and we probably weren't showcasing some of the good stuff, and we weren't focusing in the right places. Customers being more climate aware, as I mentioned, they want to associate with brands that share their views. And then a big part for us being on a, being a, a PLC 
we saw ESG issues being a, a, a more overt consideration from, a, from a, an investment world perspective. So the increase in, in, um, in investor uh, ESG matrices in the, in the last 10 years has been, it's been astronomical. It's an industry in itself. And when you look at any of the investor, any of the big investors, so whether that's BlackRock or Aviva or whoever, when you look at their policy notes for where they put their funds, you'll see ESG sits at the very top nowadays. So we've yeah, summarised, we've always been committed to, to do the right thing, we, but we reflected on how we could do that and how we could be more of a leader in our sector. So we really recognise what we do, but also we help some of the other organisations out there just shape their thinking as well. So Greg's pledge. So Greg's pledge is 10 things that we've committed to between 2020 and 2025. So five years, not a massively long time. I know we were talking earlier about building infrastructure to be there for 30 years. Five years in retail, is a, it's, it's a generation, it's a lifetime. Um, so we've, built, we, we've bu built a plan that's based on a five-year window. So it's far enough away where you can make a real impact, but it's close enough where you're not going to leave it and not say, right, I'll get to that in three years' time. Um, so we've got 10 things there based on three key themes, three buckets as we call them. So we've got building stronger, healthier communities. So that's communities where our people come from, our colleagues, uh, where our customers come from, but also where our supply base is as well. Having a global supply base, it's really important to make sure we make those communities thrive as much as we do in the UK. Creating a safer planet, so doing what we can to, to, to minimise our waste, uh, our, our energy use, and then move towards decarbonisation as well. And then the last one is to be a better business. So we think we're very good, but we want to be we want to be seen as real leaders in this. We want to be even more transparent. We want to lead on those key topics that were really important at the time, back in 2019, 2020. So around diversity, around our sourcing, and around animal welfare. So there were our key, there are ten key things. Am I talking too fast? And what we also did is we didn't want to just do something on our own. So we worked with the UN. So the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals. So we worked with the, the UN Global Compact to make sure we mapped all the stuff that we were doing to make sure that had an impact on, on the UN SDGs as well. So what you'll see there is we, we did this audit last year. Um, so we had a third party come and audit and just say, right, we've marked our homework. Can you mark our homework for us? So they came back and they said, actually, of, of the 10 things that we're doing, we're actually impacting. So that's having a direct impact on the targets that sit behind the SDGs across seven of the SDGs. We're contributing to uh, the targets on a further nine, and we're supporting that last one as well. So we feel we're doing the right thing in terms of Greg's, but we're also having an impact more globally as well. So I don't want to really talk about the, the uh, stronger building, stronger healthy communities piece, or the better business piece, I will, because of the, the topic of the day. I just wanted to talk you through where we are from a safer planet point of view. Um, we pledged to be, so they, these were our words back in 2020. They look fairly immature now, don't they? Carbon neutral, wouldn't get away with it now. We pledged to become a carbon neutral zero waste business by the end of 2025. So this is where we are. So our commitment five within our Greg's pledge is we will be on our way to achieving carbon neutrality by using 100% renewable energy across all of our operations by the end of 2025. We need to reduce our scope one and two footprint within there. And then we've also set our longer term net zero emissions roadmap as well. Um, where's the guy who from Maersk who was in who was on first? So you put your you put your scope one and two numbers up before, and I'm thinking, God, mine's tiny in comparison. It's probably it's not even equivalent to probably one of your boats. Um, but we've still got the same issues, we've still got the same challenges around uh, around renewables. So you'll see within there. Our scope two is fairly small. Our scope, our scope one is uh, diesel, natural gas for cooking, um, a bit of LPG within there, and there's a bit of petrol and then refrigeration leaks as well. We have been very clear in terms of setting our ambitions externally. So we worked with the British Retail Consortium because I, I see collaboration in this space as being hugely important um, and being non-commercial as well. Um, so we worked with the British Retail Consortium uh, to build their climate roadmap. So there was, I think there was 30, uh, 30 people on the original stakeholder group to build what the retail, the, the retail roadmap looked like and then set those clear ambitious targets. So that's to be net zero for scope two by 2030, scope one by 35, and then scope three by 2040. So they're really, they, you know, they're, they're really ambitious targets. Um, 
I'm glad my, my boss and my, and my finance director is not in the room when I say this. And if you are recording it, just change this bit. Um, scope one and two, we're in a good place on. We've got a good idea of where we're going on it. Scope three is very different for us. It's a real, real challenge. Um, and that's where the collaboration piece comes in because anything that we want to do from a scope three point of view, because we all buy globally, we buy food. It's a, it's round about, a th is it round about a third of the, uh, I think it's a third of uh, carbon emissions come from, come from the, the, the growing and the production of food. Um, we need to share innovation around this space. So it's no good for me to go away and go and do our little thing and keep it secret. It's just as important to share that through the BRC work with the McDonald's and the Costas and the Sainsbury's and whoever in this world, and vice versa as well. We've also set our science-based targets. So again, setting that really clear ambition um, and trying to use that ambition to drive innovation and drive that really uncomfortable feeling of, 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 of knowing you've got a target and you're not really sure how you're going to get there. So we set our science-based targets last year. So that was to reduce our absolute scope one and two by 46.2% by 2030. That's doable. Um, but also to, to do our scope three, uh, reduce our absolute scope threes by the same percentage, so 46.2% um, uh, by 2030 as well. Now this is in a business that's probably going to double from when we set those, set those numbers by 2026, we'll have probably doubled the size of the business in terms of turn turnover. And then by 2030, we'll be an even bigger organization. So they're based on a 2019 baseline. That's a, that's a struggle, that's a, that's a tough ask. But we've been doing this for a while. This is not something we've just started doing. So I'm not sure if you can see all of that, but we set our first carbon intensity target in 2010. We were ahead of a lot of the, the majority of other retailers out there. Um, we did CDP for the first time. So again, somebody else marking our homework in 2012. I'll not talk through all of these. We did our internal, uh, we did our, our pledge build, uh, working with all of our, our stakeholders and doing a materiality matrix based on that which was fairly carbon heavy, I have to be honest. Um, we launched Greg's Pledge in 2020. We did our public net zero uh, targets in 2020 as well. I've mentioned what we've done with the SBTI. Um, we've also done our scope three modeling. So we modeled in 2019, we modeled in 2021 based on 2019 numbers and we've just modeled about four months ago. We've modeled against our 2022 numbers as well. Now climate science uh, within from a scope three point of view, um, Again, I, I use the word I used earlier. It's fairly immature, so so yeah, the 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 the, the science behind it, and it's from a modelling point of view, is getting more pointy, and it's getting more pointy on a month by month, year by year basis as well. So we're seeing that granular data improve more and more. We are seeing our supply base as well start to change how they're measuring, because it's not just Greg's asking them for stuff. Where it's not just my my team who are speaking to our beef suppliers or our milk suppliers and say, can you give us, can you give us a, a carbon intensity for your product and make sure that it's verified and it's cradle to grave and or cradle to gate. Um, Marks and Spencer are asking the same numbers. McDonald's are asking them. So we're seeing a bit of movement within the, in, within the industry, but it's a fairly slow build, I have to be honest. Some of the things that works and helps us really drive sustainability across the business, especially from a net zero point of view, We've got a very clear governance structure for sustainability. It sits of one of the, as one of the, one of the committees uh, of our exec. So we have an operating board committee and then uh, alongside that we have our sustainability committee as well. We have a net zero steering group, uh, which is aligned to that, that sustainability committee and that's championed by, we have an exec level champion on that as well. So there's a couple of subject matter experts in there, uh, include myself who will help that, but it's driven from the very top end of the organization. Um, from a metrics point of view, we've got public net zero ambitions and that's targets, milestones out there. So we've put our hand up or our head above the parapet, however you want to say it. Um, and we've been very clear on doing that. So because we've done that, we've got to then report on it and we've got to drive as much as we can to try and hit those because we've made that promise to all of our stakeholder group. We've got very transparent reporting. So that's internally and externally. So we share our scope one and two footprint on a period basis. Uh, with our exec and, and key management teams within the business uh, and we use that to pull levers and do whatever we need to do one in terms of improving performance on a year but on a month by month or period by period basis uh, but we also do it to look where we've got peaks and troughs and where there's opportunities to improve going forward so some of the learnings from that reporting piece we're now building into our plan in 24 25 and 26 as well 
And then the last two things that we do, so our senior management team have got a long-term incentive plan. So um, round about, I think it's around about 400, 400 of our senior managers, um, we've got that, that, that LTIP in place. Now part of that LTIP, so obviously some of it's on sales, some of it's on profitability. We've got an element of that LTIP which has been based around scope one and two uh, reductions as well. So that helps drive those non-believers, it helps them get involved and see the importance. We talked about carbon literacy earlier, I think it was the, just the last the, the last uh, speaker mentioned it. Um, so we use we've used the LTIP to try and help drive that carbon literacy across the across the senior management organisation. So it's great. I go to speak to people who I would never think would have any involvement with that, about this before, and they're talking to me about scopes. It's just really it's really interesting uh, and really exciting. Uh, I sound really boring when I say that, don't I? But it is exciting. Um, and then the other thing that we've done there, we've got a, 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 a clear cons a carbon consideration within our capital projects work as well. So any of the build work, we've got a big capital expenditure plan for the next few years. Uh, any of the big stuff that we do, carbon's a real consideration of that. We built, um, we built a, a, a freezer unit in the northeast, which is our, was, I think it was our biggest supply chain build for a number of years. I think it was about 60 million. Um, it was very clear when we set that project up from, the, from our chief exec and our investment board that that would be built with sustainability in mind. And that's been, that, was a, that was a real driver to get that real senior leadership talking about that, the, the fact that we're gonna build sustainability into this plan. That's had long lasting effects in terms of our project teams because they're thinking about it straight away. So before, when they're at scoping, uh, at, at, a, at a point of scoping, they're already thinking right from a sustainability point of view, what do we need to consider? Because when we go in that investment board to ask the questions about whether we, we get the thumbs up or thumbs down, we know those questions are going to be asked of us. Have I gone over time yet? Right. I'll not, I'll not talk through all of, all of all my, uh, uh, the reduction activity that we've done because it's probably a little bit embarrassing that we're a, a bunch of uh, you know, decarbonisation experts in the room. The one that I will pull out though is that, is that piece around scope three. So this collaboration bit is really, really important to us and we need that collaboration across the value chain and across our sector to deliver against this. There's lots of us have signed up to those BRC targets. We need to share that learning. We've done our value chain modeling. We've done some workshops with our key material suppliers and we've been Greg's. We've asked them nicely if they can do four things. Measure and report their own footprint, move to renewable energy, set a public net zero date and set an SBT. Um, that's starting to drive some change in the industry and across, the, across that value chain sector as well. So that's been very good. Um, Summarise, a few key takeaways. So Greg's Pledge, one of the things that Greg's Pledge has given us, it's given us an internal bit of jargon. So we use the term Greg's Pledge about lots of things. So Mike, uh, our, our head of procurement, um, who's, a who's a lifer in Greg's, Alan Honeyman's been with Greg's for a long time. He's a true procurement guy, he wants it. Whatever he's trying to buy, he wants it yesterday and he wants it for free. I've got Alan now talking about, right, what's this looking like from a Greg's Pledge point of view? So use just, just as something as simple as having that brand has had an effect on how we operate, as a, how we think as an organisation. Those public targets and metrics have demonstrated our ambitions to our stakeholders and means we've got to deliver against them. Our governance structure provides a good framework to deliver against that. And then working with our value chain, chain partners is probably the most important thing if we want to hit that 2040 score three deadline. Thank you. Any questions?